Hi, Lila. Hello. Nice to see you here at Slush, your first Slush, right? It is, and my first time to Finland. Is that right? Yes. Double whammy. Country 102. <laughs> first trip since the pandemic has started. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. we're delighted to have you here. Um, and thank you for uh, agreeing to, to have this conversation. Um, I'd love to sort of like dig in as a first question. Obviously, you've been at DeepMind since 2018. That's correct. Um, really fascinating career in, in the Valley. Um, encompassed a really broad array of different organizations, different experiences, different kind of roles. So I think it'd be really interesting for, for the audience here today just to sort of like begin the conversation with, if you can just talk a little bit about your career history and your experience up to now. Great, thank you. Um, hello everyone. Um, I started my career in tech about 30 years ago uh, and I could have never predicted the journey that I've had. So I started off as a, an engineer. I was an electrical engineer on a product called the Pentium Processor, which was very revolutionary at the time yep. in personal computing. And my, I ended up spending 18 years at Intel. Okay. And during that time, I worked in the United States and I spent six years in Asia. I had a variety of uh, roles that spanned technology and product yeah. and then moved into marketing and management. Yeah. Uh, my last few jobs were quite interesting because I became chief of staff to the CEO and chairman and then went to run our education product group. Okay. And when you look back at my career at Intel, it was really starting to show the intersection of technology and social impact. And also an, a phrase I learned which was called entrepreneur. Like, how do you be an entrepreneur in a large organization? And so when an opportunity came to go to venture capital firm, Kleiner Perkins, Caulfield & Byers, um, I took, took the chance and went and did a, uh, several years in Silicon Valley venture capital firm, where one of the investments I helped make was a company called Coursera, okay. which I went into as the first business executive when the company was le about 40 people, mm. no revenue. And the company just went public earlier this year, which is quite exciting. Yeah. But I kind of helped to stand it up, get it on a path towards uh, profit revenue, profitability, and then decided I was going to take a year off to decide what was next in my life when a company called DeepMind came calling. And uh, I had to make the tough decision whether I wanted to move the family to London to, be, to take this opportunity, which I did. And it's been three amazing years. And in the process of all that, I also have a um, ed tech nonprofit, so, and joined a public company board. So I've had quite a variety of experience, which in some ways, like I said, was not predictable yeah. 30 years ago. And yet at the same time, it's prepared me extraordinarily well for the role that I have now at DeepMind. So a really kind of diverse sort of series of experiences, um, you know, in, in senior, le senior leadership roles. Can you maybe just pick out a couple of experiences that you can share with you know, the founders here um, that really sort of like shape your leadership style? So like maybe instances, things that have occurred and, 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 and have really kind of educated you and made you think about how best to lead? Yeah, um, you know, the first one maybe that I'll answer is when I, I didn't even know I was a leader. Okay. Um, so I was in university and I was working on um, one of my engineering projects with some of the smartest folks in my, my year group. And at the very end, we were each individually asked who led the group. And to my shock, um, everyone said me. And it was kind of a, a, a journey in self-awareness of being a leader and what a leader meant. And right. that I actually could be a leader uh, of people that I felt were much more technically competent at that time than I was. And it reminded me, it, um, I use that as an example because later in my career, um, a very famous Silicon Valley coach named Bill Campbell yep. gave, uh, had a saying which was, your title, you're a manager by title, yeah. but your people make you a leader. Right. And so that was the lesson that I had very early in my career. But then there were two other quotes, if I may, from mentors along the way that I think really kind of punctuated what it meant to be a leader. Yeah. The first was I was chief of staff to the CEO and chairman at Intel. And we were pioneering a lot of new areas, which I would think many of the entrepreneurs are here are doing the same. And when you're doing profound work like that, you tend to take uh, a lot of doubters and people who say, oh, you can't do it this way. 
And, uh, but when you're leading teams, you have to be the one to be that human shield and push things through. So he sat me down and he said, Lila, listen, pioneers end up with more arrows in their back because you're forging a new way. He said, just stop occasionally. Let me take those arrows out so you can run further faster. Right. Right. And to me, that really meant, showed what a leader was. And the f last thing I'll, I'll just add was, I think um, another saying that I heard along the way that I really believe in is um, uh, leadership roles are about finding good people with good ideas and creating the environment uh, for them to succeed. And this is perhaps one of my most important leadership um, lessons uh, in defining moments in my career. So when I was at Intel in, in that chief of staff role, there was a moment when the company was not executing. And we, there was a lot of infighting and pointing fingers at the time. And the CEO said, this is ridiculous. We have really important work to do. I'm going to write a note to the company and let's just expect that it will be leaked. And he said, I'm going to take responsibility and then we can just get on with the work. And that's exactly what happened. So I went to him and I said, hey, all this negative press, isn't it, how are you not taking this personally? And he said, it's my responsibility as a leader to be accountable and to get people focused on where they can add the most value. Now, if you fast forward much later in my career, I faced the same issue where someone in my organization was made a very, they had good intent and they changed uh, a policy on the organization without anybody knowing or communicating, but it came from a good place of good intent. And I think these days there's a lot of, can be a lot of anxiety around these types of yeah. topics when things happen to employees unexpectedly. So within hours, I stood up in front of the entire company. I had to take responsibility and so that everyone else could move forward. And so this, person, this other leader in the company could get on and not be marred, not be impacted negatively by trying to take a risk, but rather can learn from it and, and move forward. And that's exactly what happened. So I think it's at the time, it, I felt like the most hated person in the organization, but it was really important for me as a leader to role model the accountability and responsibility that I wanted to see, as well as to provide the air cover for that risk taking, which I think is the only way that organizations can succeed, is not being complacent, but by taking calculated risks. So I was watching the session earlier on with Sonali and Sujata, and they were talking about the COO role specifically. And it's clear that there's different kinds of ways of interpreting that role and executing that role. How do you think about it? Like, what, what's your style as a COO? Yeah, it's, um, it's a great question because I do think COO roles are very different depending on the CEO and the founder right. and where the organization is at this time. When uh, I, I've done this role, COO role, a couple of times now, and one of the things I've learned is how important it is to really click with the founder. Right. So I spent 50 hours interviewing at DeepMind with Demis. And I went into it saying, I'm going, I don't want to move to London in the winter time uh, so, with my family. So let me, tr I'm not sure I'm ready for, for this role. So let me really test him. And through that, I found very clear values alignment. Right. And I think it's very, when you go into a new role, you always think about what could be possible and all the great things. But I actually like to challenge in the worst of times, will this be someone that I can stand behind or in front of and really be a partner with? So I would say that my style of, of COO is very much of being um, kind of a servant leader to the organization, to the mission, and to the founder. Now that means sometimes I have to step up and take responsibility, and it means sometimes I have to uh, be the partner and think about how do I take the vision of the CEO, make it happen, in a way that's aligned with the values mm -hmm. um, and to bring the organization along in a way where they feel empowered. You talk about values. I'm interested to know how as COO you kind of codify that. How do you put that into practice in the, in the real world, in the nitty gritty of a complex organization? Yeah, I, I, values are to me one of those things that it's not just a checklist of like, okay, because um, when I've been in two other organizations where I had to help us codify the values, 
And it was a lengthy process to make sure that they're very much part of the DNA of the organization and not something that's aspirational and inauthentic. Yeah. Because I think to codify values, they need to be really part of how you want to run the organization. So the question about operationalizing them, maybe I can give you an yeah. example. Um, at DeepMind, uh, the week that I started, the company had just codified its values, which um, are pioneering, mission-driven, collaboration, responsible, and kind. Which, by the way, I was not, I was like surprised to see kind on a tech company, but I think it really did um, s s reflect in the organization. Now, what I got stopped and people questioned me about were, how can you have responsible and pioneering? Like, don't those clash? Isn't it contradictory? So we had to really figure out quickly how we were going to operationalize those two values to make it stick. So I think part of it as a leader is creating, building this into the fabric of the day-to-day the -day operations. Right. So for example, when you're hiring, how are you hiring with questions around the values? How are you onboarding? Are you as a leader giving the space for these types of conversations to happen? So for example, we started a meeting, um, a working group about how we were going to pioneer responsibly with our very complicated advanced AI research. You can't predict the downstream impact, but we got everyone around a table and we had a meeting that I refused to give it a name because I didn't want people to feel pressure, but rather like, let's talk about our responsibility here. Do we have the right people in the room? How do we bring the outside voices in so that we're not having our anchored on our insider bias? So me spending my time and focus and giving the air cover to the organization was really important early on. And so was Demis, the CEO and founder, doing the same. But then we did other things. So we brought in, um, we decided to focus some of our research in this space. So around decolonial AI, right. around queer fairness. Yeah. We started up a socio-technical communi research community inside the organization with outside speakers. We took uh, over three quarters of the company through ethics training, like within a very short amount of time. And all of this was really about giving not just saying it, but giving people in the organization the responsibility and the air cover to do this and show that it was a critical part of the way that we, we are going to operate the company and that they will be rewarded and supported for doing that. And you mentioned you know, one of the roles of the COO, or the, or the principal role of the CEO, uh, COO is to support the founder. Founders set the tone of the organization. How do you both support Demis or any founder um, while also kind of bringing in outside voices, bringing in kind of like external influences, as it were, that might actually sort of have a positive impact on the org. Yeah, it's, I think this is why some of, hiring to me is like one of the most important things that um, any leader can do. And it's uh, once you do that first hiring and make sure that there's value alignment. So one of the mistakes I've often seen in hiring um, senior people, especially from a founder perspective from when I was in venture capital, is people wanted just somebody who had that experience and they didn't really necessarily um, interview for in tough times, will this be a good fit and are they values aligned? When you come on board, I think it's really important that the founder, uh, the CEO spends the time to not just make decisions, but to help people understand why they got to that decision. Right. And so Demis and I spent a lot of time up front where he would give me the context or he would say something and I would be like, okay, tell me why, why do you think that? How did you get to this answer? So I almost feel like my first year was very much of having an ethnographer hat on and sitting back and observing and learning and respecting everything that had been built. It's pretty amazing what founders can do with just their passion and energy and vision. And I think in a COO role, you really are trying to build upon that. And so it's not trying to change anything, it's rather trying to understand where do we need to go. Fantastic what's been built, where do we wanna go, and how can we get there in a way that feels authentic while building capabilities for where we want to go. And so I think as a COO, showing respect for the founder and showing that values alignment, showing respect for the organization and appreciation is really important. And one of the 
I think the concerns is people come in and they feel like they need to do something right away. Right. So timing gets to be very important. And when you have to make decisions quickly, when I had to do that, at least saying, here's why I'm doing this, not just that I'm coming in and trying to change everything. So I'm interested to sort of like just maybe get your sense of what makes great founders. You know, a lot of good founders out there, but what might great, obviously you've worked in venture capital, you've obviously had senior leadership uh, roles in very significant companies. When you think about the founders you've, you know, interacted with, what separates those really great founders from the ones who are good? I, there's an uh, element of self-awareness, I think, with great founders, where they understand themselves and are trying to just be the best of themselves rather than trying to be someone they're not. I think sometimes, um, whether it's a founder or any leader, any person, like you try, you say, okay, I'm now in this position. I now have people working for me. Right. I've got to be this other person that they expect. And I think that's really where you end up having some clashes. Instead, if you can understand who you are and just own it and build off of your strengths, so surround yourself with people. I think great founders surround themselves with people who can um, complement them uh, and you know, have different skills, but maybe this is where the different skills but shared values I think are very important. And so having that diversity of thought where they can make the, get to the mission in a better, more responsible way. Um, I think founders who spend time investing in the organization. Now, there's a lot of things that you know, a founder, only a founder can do an early stage startup. Um, but you have to be external, you have to be internal. And yet you can't just hand things over and completely let go of your responsibility. Yeah. Uh, so make, figuring out how do you scale yourself and how do you be clear about what you really care about and want to be involved in, because that will set the entire organization up for success from an early stage. What I found often happens is um, with uh, with founders is you get an entire company can sit around a table and you're making decisions really fast and everyone under has that same shared context. But then all of a sudden you can't fit a company in a meeting room, let alone one floor, let alone one building. And so great, what great founders have done is they've really built the right size, the process, integrated the values, enabled the teams, are clear about where they want to be involved, and don't try to have their arms on everything, but try to have their focus on the things where they can really drive things forward. Right. And, and, and when you get to that point where the org's grown, you're no longer able to sort of fit in the meeting room, maybe you've got, you know, you've moved out of one floor of the building, you've, you've, you've grown into a larger organization. How, as COO, do you go about thinking how, you know, often sort of like competing, people are competing for resources, they're competing for your time, for Demis's time. How do you bring people together and facilitate a really kind of constructive dialogue so that the company can move forward? How do you kind of get that consensus? Yeah, um, I, it's different in every organization. I think one underlying uh, similarity is to really introduce a concept of that we're a learning organization. Right. And we have the benefit at DeepMind, at Coursera with education so it was, and learning, so sure. we were always learning. And at DeepMind, we're training our artificial intelligence to learn, so we should be an organization that learns and evolves as well. So I think if you can do that from the beginning mm. and really build that in, so, you know, this week we're trying this, and, um, you know, next, next year, this is what's changed in the global context. This yeah. is where we're at. So we're going to have to make some adap adaptations to how we organize. Now, I think what happens is some people are used to, you know, you get people used to a certain levels of information. So how you scale that is really, I think it depends a lot on the culture. What we've found is um, trying to enable uh, employee groups to form and communities to form around topics that they care about, like security, et cetera, and then have an executive sponsor so that, you know, even I have a quite a large uh, uh, organization that covers everything from engineering to program management to our governance and external relationships. So I can't be in everything even though I care about it, but finding ways where the, there's information flow yeah. and getting them to communicate with each other because then what comes to me is more coordinated. So 
you've been in Europe three years now? Um, yeah, three and a half. Okay, so this is you know one of the leading European uh, tech events. So you've kind of got a really interesting sort of like window into obviously the Valley, you've worked there many years, but also into the to, to Europe tech scene. I know you've not been able to travel much, but I'd love to, to get your impressions of, you know, what, what, what can Europe learn from the Valley, but also maybe what can the Valley learn from Europe? There's a lot of very kind of like interesting businesses coming out of Europe, Deep, Deep Mind being one of them. Like, what, what can we maybe teach um, the Bay Area? Yeah. Uh- It's been an interesting learning journey for me in that respect. Uh, Having spent six years in Asia and the rest of my career in the Silicon Valley, when I moved to London and started experiencing uh, DeepMind and the tech scene there in general, I started reflecting what would have happened if DeepMind had picked up and moved to the Bay Area. And one of the things that really struck me was how I think European companies tend to bring humanity into the work every day. Right. Um, I think here in this environment, everyone is surrounded by arts and culture in a very different way than Silicon Valley. Um, I used to commute uh, to my the multiple roles I had in Silicon Valley, and you're passing billboards of uh, tech companies and. If you come from an engineering background like me, you think it's the coolest thing ever, but then after a while, you just realize you're kind of caught up in that little bubble. Yeah. Whereas I feel like my commute now, I'm passing an art school. I'm walking by, um, I'm taking the two past stations where the theater district is. Uh, my colleagues come from so many different nationalities and speak so many languages. And you just bring some of the that world and that global perspective and mm. that, into your work, which means you feel a lot more responsibility yeah. for what you're developing. Yeah. And then the second thing, I was at a dinner last night with some of the attendees here, and I was really struck by the successful entrepreneurs and how they're pulling up the current community mm. and really investing and giving back and enabling um, the earlier, the younger generation to uh, build from their experience, um, whether it's investments or events like this. And I think there's something that's quite... Um, exciting about that because it's not about um, one sector of investment, uh, like proving out an investment thesis, and it's not about one geography, I'm only investing in this um, city, but rather taking a a perspective of like, who are great founders, what do they need, where are they, what are they working, what are the tough problems for the world that they're working on, so that social impact I think shows up here too. So it's interesting you talk about social impact and you talk about the kind of like the humanity of, of, of Europe because when um, we first talked, I think it was fairly soon after you'd taken on the role, you described your decision to join DeepMind as a moral calling, which I thought was a really interesting sort of like phrase to use. Can you just dig into that a little bit? Um, yeah, so when I was interviewing with DeepMind, I thought if I wanted to do artificial intelligence, I can stay in Silicon Valley, you know, all my friends, all, the inve- all these investments that are being made in new startups. And the more I learned about DeepMind, I was really intrigued. So the mission is solve intelligence to advance science and benefit humanity. And I thought, oh, okay, this is pretty audacious. <laughs> and so the conversations I had with um, Demis, the founder, CEO, and Shane, the chief scientist and co-founder, were pretty um, awe-inspiring of what can an artificial general intelligence do with humanity and with humans in, involved, and how can we use this technology as a tool? And I asked a simple question of like, okay, well, how do you know if it's doing the right thing? Can't you just program in the ethics? And then we got into a very deep conversation about um, responsibility and accountability, which they had been thinking about since even before DeepMind was founded. And I went home that evening and I thought, I have twin daughters, and I'm like, can my, can they know that mommy worked on this technology? And how will I feel about that later? And uh, I thought, well, I'm not an AI expert. I don't know ML. And yet, I think my very diverse background and experience that I can bring some of that into uh, work. And I'm far enough along in my career. I'm not proving anything. I'm here to try to help organizations achieve their mission. And so I actually sat down with my husband and we had the conversation and and I said, I think my weird career, this very circuitous route, 
is, has trained me to take on this role. And I feel like it is a moral calling if I can do something for the world that's bigger than me. It's helping these incredible entrepreneurs achieve their mission and pioneer responsibly. So we're up against time, but I'm really fascinated, just as a final question, we've got many founders in the room. You know, you've had this really sort of like remarkable career. You've obviously sort of like experienced many kind of different founders. What kind of like piece of advice would you give founders who are maybe starting their journey? You know, maybe they're a very early stage and they're, they're trying to you know, cobble, cobble things together. Like what advice would you give them in order for them to sort of like really stay, stay through the journey and, you know, and, and enjoy it, frankly, you know, enjoy the experience of, you know, an ama- you know growing, a, growing an amazing team and a great, growing an amazing business. Oh, I'm sure you have a lot of good advice for, <laughs> for them too. Um, I'm right, interested in getting your answer sometime on that, Greg. Um, <laughs> I think from my experience in venture capital and having worked with uh, founders over decades, I would say um, be really honest with yourself of where you can add value and what gives you energy and excitement. And then be very thoughtful about who you're bringing around you, even if it's a co-founder, even if it's senior hires with experience or, you know, someone earlier in their career who doesn't have experience but you want to take a bet on, they are joining because of you and because of what your vision for what you're building. And it's very important that you create the time and the space for them to understand how expectations that you may have around what you want to build and how you want to build it and why the things are important. And I think sometimes founders are so... can be so focused, which is amazing. That's absolutely a strength. But you have to be careful that it's not to the detriment of your health and of creating an organization that is completely dependent on you. Because in that way, I've seen founders get in the way of achieving their mission. So the final piece of advice I would have is look outside the organization and think about who your personal board of advisors are. And I'm not talking about your investors in your board. I'm talking about the people that will help you on your journey as a leader Mm. and who will give you the tough advice and feedback or be a sounding board when you need it the most. And sometimes the people who are closest to you are trying to protect you. And instead you need someone who can really be honest, who you can have that candid feedback with. And investing in that relationship early is important because if you wait until you have problems, then it's almost too late. Uh, And then finally, I would just say, I've been blown away by entrepreneurs throughout my career. Um, I'm a COO because I like working with people who have that type of vision where I know I can help operationalize it and make it happen. But I think what the talent that you all have, it's something that I don't know that people are necessarily born with. So I think it is really special. And just remember that, that you're in a very privileged position and um, really looking forward to seeing what everyone here builds. That's a great note to finish on. Lila, thank you so much for braving London winters and for coming here to Europe. And, pleasure to uh, be here. Yeah, thank you for sharing your thoughts on leadership. It was great. a great pleasure. Thank you for thank joining you. us here at Slush. Thank you.